I'm going to continue along the, uh, the theme that I began the last several sermons, last two or three or four, I guess. I've lost count by now. But uh, I'm going to continue that theme, which has to do with the covenant, has to do with Israel and God's purpose for Israel. As mentioned before, the Bible from Genesis, the 12th chapter to the end of the Old Testament is, as we all know, is the story of Abraham and the nation descended from him. I don't think anybody would question that. You just have to, all you have to do is read the book and you see that's what the story is all about. Abraham's family. God's purpose for that family, which was to become a great nation and inherit a land God specifically selected for it, was to serve as a model nation for the other nations of the world. That is to say, the other families of the earth, as it states in Genesis, the 12th chapter, in the original promise given to Abraham. Thus, Israel's purpose was to bring knowledge of the true God to the world. But it succinctly, briefly stated, that was God's purpose for the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was to be a servant to the world, not an empire exercising lordship over the other nations. That wasn't God's purpose, but was to serve the nations by bringing them knowledge of the true God, by being the model nation that God intended them to be, to show the nations of the world the blessings of the Torah law and of, of all the blessings that come with obedience to the true God. But did the story of the elect nation end with the last book of the Old Testament? That's my question for you. Did the story of this elect nation, Israel, did it end with the last book of the Old Testament? Does the New Testament and the story of Jesus take us in an entirely new direction with a new elect people, a new elect people, a new covenant, new, new, new? You know, this, that's the story. But is that true? Well, the words of the angel Gabriel, as recorded in Luke, the first chapter, give us a clue. If you turn there with me, Luke, the first chapter, you'll recall that Gabriel appeared to a young maiden, a young virgin named, I'm assuming young, a young virgin named Mary. And we'll take up the account in verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that he points out along the way that this Joseph was of the house of David. We understand if you look at Mary's genealogy too, she goes back to David. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Now, so far, everybody knows this story, don't they? But we're going to get into something that is oftentimes, I would say, a neglected part of the story, an overlooked part of the story, or something that is perhaps spiritualized. But let's read on. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. It sounds like a continuation of the same story, doesn't it? The story of Abraham's family, the elect nation, the people of Israel. And here we have this Davidic king, the one who is to reign over Israel. The angel tells Mary that that's him, and he will reign over the house of of Jacob forever. Now, the child that was miraculously conceived and born to Mary was to have a herald who would prepare the way before him, that is to say, before his ministry. Of course, we understand that was John the Baptist. Now, listen to what the same angel, Gabriel, 
said to the coming herald's father, a priest named Zacharias. Look at the same chapter here, Luke chapter 1, go back to verse 13. <clears throat> But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit. That reference to wine and strong drink means he's going to be a Nazarite from birth. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Notice the emphasis here. Many of the children of Israel. And what's he doing? He's preparing the way before the one who the angel tells Mary is to be king over the house of Jacob forever. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. He's quoting from Malachi 4 and verses 5 and 6. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Then after the chosen herald John was born, his father Zacharias, whose tongue had been temporarily bound, Prophesied. Look at the prophecy still in Luke, the first chapter, over beginning in verse 67. Verse 67, Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He's speaking proleptically, of course, because he knows that what has been prophesied concerning his son John, who is to be the herald of the Messiah, he is speaking proleptically, in other words, of a future event, but as if it were already done when he says the Lord God has visited and redeemed his people. In other words, it's certain. He will. And, he, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, <clears throat> who, have been said, who have been since the world began... That he who have uh, uh, who have been that's correct since the world began thought I misread it there that we should be saved from our enemies that who should be saved from their enemies Israel that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers meaning our Israelite fathers and to remember his holy covenant which covenant would that be the covenant he made with Abraham. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham, there it is, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him with fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. You know, all of this is about Israel, isn't it? And you, child, speaking to John, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day, day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Now, all that we just read leaves me with the impression, and I'll bet it leaves you with the same impression, that the story <coughs> of Abraham's family, that's the elect nation, continues right on into the New Testament. Don't you get that clear impression from reading all this? Well, of course you do. How can you miss it? You have to spiritualize it away to, to make it say anything else. So the story of the elect nation continues right into the New Testament. So we haven't changed gears and gone in a different direction, have we? No, it's the same story of Israel and of Israel's Messiah and of God's purpose for the elect nation. Now, with all of this in mind, I want you to notice what the Messiah proclaims once his ministry begins. A lot of people will hear, will read, and they'll hear terms and phrases, and they think immediately, they say, oh yes, that's about going to heaven when you die. 
Uh, and the fact is, it's not. That's, that's completely out of the picture. That's not what he has in mind here at all. But let's, let's look at a few scriptures. Go back to Matthew 4 with me. Matthew chapter 4. And let's see what uh, the Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, begins uh, teaching <coughs> once his Galilean ministry is underway. In Matthew chapter 4, first of all, let's look at uh, verse 17. It says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Other, the other gospel writers would say kingdom of God. This is a kingdom, not a kingdom in heaven, but a kingdom ruled from heaven. What do you think he has in mind here when he talks about the kingdom? Well, we'll, we'll get to that in just a few moments. But it says it began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now go on to verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Why do you think he healed diseases and sicknesses among the people? To confirm his message. And what was his message? The good news of the kingdom. Now, what kingdom is that? Nobody said, oh, we get to go to heaven now. No, no. we get to go up yonder where Abraham and all them are. <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. That's not what they had in mind at all. You know, we can, we can take these later, these ideas that came later that were borrowed in some measure from Greek philosophy and read it back into this text. But that's not what this is about at all, as we shall see. Let's go into a couple of other pa uh, passages. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. This is a famous one, one we're all familiar with because we like prophetic stuff. <coughs> Before you go there, let's go to Matthew 9. Matthew chapter 9. And uh, look at verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. There it is again. And once again, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So he had these these message confirming miracles taking place as he preached the good news of the kingdom. Now then to Matthew 24. You know Matthew 24 the question was what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age and uh, Jesus begins to talk about some of the things that they can expect to happen. He mentions false Christ, he mentions wars and rumors of wars. Those are the th things they saw in their day, things that have been seen down through the centuries, things we certainly see in our day. But he says, see that you're not troubled in verse 6. See that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. In other words, these are not necessarily signs of the end. The end is not yet when you see these things. Don't think it is. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. We've seen that across the centuries. People, the different uh, nations living across the centuries uh, have seen these things. But it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. The term is the same term used of birth pangs. In other words, you know, when the birth pangs begin, you know that, you know what that means. You ladies who've given birth, you know what that means. Time to get to the hospital. <laughs> you know, it's, time, it's because you know that the baby will be coming soon. And so the point here is that you see all of these things. Don't think that they in themselves mean the end has come. But they will intensify as you get closer to the end. Just as the, you know, the birth pangs become more and more intense over time. And then he goes on to talk about uh, you know, the tribulation upon the saints. They'll deliver you to tribulation and so on. But there's one other thing here that he says will happen before the end. One other thing. Remember what he did. Well, also we, we read back there that John the Baptist preached the good news of the kingdom. Jesus came along preaching the good news of the kingdom. Guess what's going to happen before the end? He says in verse 14, And this gospel, this good news of the kingdom, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, over in Acts chapter 1, we begin to get a 
little bit of an idea. I think you already have an idea, but in Acts chapter 1, it should give everyone an idea as to exactly what the kingdom was that was being talked about in all of these scriptures. The kingdom that Jesus preached, the kingdom that John preached, the kingdom that will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. We read about it here in Acts chapter 1. I want you to notice what it says here. Let's take up the account in verse 3. To whom also he also presented himself, talking about to his disciples, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to what? <clears throat> during this 40 day period after his resurrection when he appeared to the disciples. In this 40 days he's teaching them. He's opening their minds to the scriptures. Now they're understanding in a greater way than they had understood before. And things concerning or pertaining to what? The kingdom of God. Now then, with that in mind, let's read on down. <coughs> it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time, remember what had he been teaching them? Things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And they asked, will you, at, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So in their minds, there was still a kingdom restored to Israel to come. Is that not the kingdom of God we're talking about? Of course it is. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom he's been preaching all along. It's, it's not the, it doesn't exalt the whole, it doesn't exhaust the whole message of the kingdom. We understand that. But that is the kingdom message. Now Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't say, now you people just don't get it yet, do you? Don't you know that we're going, there's going to be a new elect people? There's going to be a, something totally new. We're going in a different direction now. Now he doesn't say that at all. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, he's confirming that the kingdom will be restored to Israel. It's just that he's saying it's not for you to know exactly when that's going to take place. What he does is emphasize that you get busy and do the job assigned to you. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Uh, and guess what they're going to be preaching? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Same message. Same message. Of course it involves repentance. Of course it involves Jesus as the Messiah. Of course it involves His shed blood and broken body, and all of those things that we understand. That's, that's all a part of it, of course. That's how you get into the kingdom. So the message of the kingdom in the New Testament is consistent with the message of the kingdom of God in the Old Testament. The prophets talked about the kingdom over and over and over again. Just read. Go back and start with Isaiah and read all the way through. You will see prophecy after prophecy after prophecy about the restoration of the kingdom. The restoration of Israel is not only just for the benefit of Israel, it's for the benefit of the world. That is the message of the kingdom of God. So the New Testament message, I say, is consistent with the Old Testament. The kingdom Jesus proclaimed was the same kingdom. The prophets proclaimed the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of Israel are all one and the same king, uh, kingdom. Now go back with me to Ezekiel, one of many, many prophecies we could go to. But let's just focus a little bit on Ezekiel today. Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel 39, <clears throat> and let's begin there in, uh, well, give me, let me get you, give you a little bit of background here first. Uh, in, in chapter 39, uh, actually going back to chapter 38, you see that some nation or some leader called Gog, and has a number of allies with him, he attacks Israel at a certain point, 
a certain point, it's always been our understanding that it's after the coming of Christ. I want to, don't want to get into the exact precise scenario in that regard. But I just want to point out that here we have enemies coming against the reestablished nation. And then God intervenes and he destroys Gog's armies. You see that in chapter uh, 39. <clears throat> and then you read about the burial of Gog. A massive burial takes place, meaning it's a massive defeat. <clears throat> and then you read something here in beginning with verse 17 that is reflected against again in Revelation chapter 19. It says, and as far and as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves. This is the message to the birds and the beasts. Assemble yourselves and come gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal. Was he talking about? The dead bodies of the enemies of Israel. Which I am sacrificing for you a great sacrificial meal on the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams and lambs and so on. It goes on. You see this reflected again. You see this again in Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> the point being that it will be a great victory for Israel, but God is the victor. He's the one who delivers the elect nation. And now we read about the new covenant, believe it or not, it doesn't use exactly that phraseology, but it nevertheless is what it's talking about. Beginning in verse 21, it says, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. <clears throat> so the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. In other words, when he sets his hand to deliver the elect nation, then there won't be any more doubt on their part. They will know from that day forward that he is God and that they are his people, his chosen nation. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel, meaning the nations round about, the, the Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore, I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of their enemies and they all fell by the sword. And of course, we know that happened, definitely happened. We've seen it happen more than, not in just one fell swoop, but in, in, in several different uh, phases in uh, the history of Israel. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel. And I will be jealous for my holy name. In other words, I'm reversing all of this. The curse they've been under. The punishment that they've had to endure. Now, I am making them the elect nation, the model nation they were intended to be from the beginning. After they have borne their shame and all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me when they dwelt safely in their own land and no one made them afraid. So they will have learned the lesson by this point. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of the enemy's lands, and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they, know, they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them anymore. For I shall, have I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. That's talking about the time when he renews the covenant with Israel in their own land, establishing them once again as the elect nation. And then he goes on through these several <coughs> chapters here. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details on this. Just I uh, will mention that he does talk about the, uh, a new city and a new temple. We've talked about that in the past. I don't know if you remember or not, but we've discussed the issue of whether or not there will be a temple, a millennial temple with a sacrificial system in place, with a Levitical system, a priesthood restored. You read all of that in here. And my position is this. It doesn't matter to me. 
it's okay with me if that's what happens but if that is the way if, if we take this in the full literal sense then uh, it is the, the temple the restoration of the sacrifices it must be understood this is not for redemptive purposes it's not for salvation we know that the blood of goats and bulls doesn't provide that it will be educative be educative for educative purposes and I'm completely fine with that if there is a millennial temple and a pure priesthood a sanctified priesthood and the animal sacrifice is now done the right way not the wrong way as they were at various times in history done with the right spirit not the wrong spirit not as an attempt to appease God or to get benefits from him while their hearts are far away from him if that's the case if indeed there is a restored temple and a restored and a restored sacrificial system then it will be for that purpose it's educative primarily in fact that's really what the sacrificial system was all along it was for purposes of education and you know the blood of bulls and goats never truly provided salvation for anyone we understand that but they will get the message here if they have Messiah ruling on the throne of David and now they're beginning to finally see what all that means you see how educative that would be for them so if indeed <clears throat> there is uh, the restoration of the priesthood and the, the sacrifices in the temple then that will what it, that's the, that's what will no doubt it will accomplish on the other hand I recognize that this is a this is a prophetic vision and you understand the nature of prophetic visions while they prophesy future realities things that are literally to happen they're woven together with symbolic language that's the way what you always have when you have prophetic visions and so some of this may well be symbolic and the description this almost perfect description of a restored priesthood a restored temple a restored uh, system of sacrifices is a way for the people who first heard the message it could be understood this way as a way simply of telling them that full and complete and perfect worship proper worship will be restored and it could be understood in symbolic language now to to show that uh, look over to chapter 47 just to show you an example of the fact that there is there is symbolism woven into this text even though we're to take it very seriously take it very literally God does intend to restore the elect nation he does intend to put them back into the land and make a great nation under the reign of King Messiah he does intend that nevertheless when you read through a prophecy like this a, a vision like this you must recognize some of these symbolic elements look at chapter 47 <coughs> verse 1 Ezekiel says then he brought me back to the door of the temple this is that the temple that he's been seeing and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east for the front of the temple faced east and water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar so he's describing what he's seeing here and then he goes on to talk about how at first it was shallow you know ankle deep then knee deep and it eventually it becomes a river he says when I returned there look at verse 7 when I returned there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other and he said to me this water flows toward the eastern region goes down into the valley and enters the sea when it reaches the sea its waters are healed you begin to think of maybe a little symbolism here and it shall be that every living thing that moves where whether in the rivers or wherever the rivers go will live there will be very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed and everything will live where, uh, wherever the river goes and then verse 12 along the bank of the river on the side of uh, uh, on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food their leaves will be will not wither and their fruit will not fail they will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary their fruit will be for food and the leaves for medicine now that could be I, I would say this is, this is a good uh, a good possible a strong possibility this is symbolic language 
It's just a way of saying that when Christ reigns, when the Messiah is here ruling, that there will be healing for the nations. You know, you see the same language in uh, Revelation 21. The same kind of language, the same kind of symbolism. So my point here is that uh, a prophecy like this in Ezekiel could cer certainly employ symbolism. And maybe some of the things, some of the things that we might tend to take literally may be understood symbolically. But the, the, the greater, the, the more important thing is, the more important thing is that the nature of the prophetic visions, we must understand that, uh, uh, that this, this is actually talking about a real event, even though it may incorporate some symbolic language in describing it. But now... With all that in mind, let's notice one interesting passage in this same chapter of Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47, and this, uh, keep in mind what the promise was to Abraham. Keep in mind all that we've said about the purpose for Israel. Again, Israel is to be a servant to the nations. That's Israel's purpose. By bringing knowledge the, the true knowledge of God to all the families of the earth as stated in the promise given to Abraham. So with that in mind, I want you to notice something very interesting here. Beginning in verse 21, it says, thus, said, the, thus you shall divide this land among yourselves. He's talking about the Israelites once they come back. According to the tribes of Israel. That tells us that those tribes will be known and will be in place once again. It shall be that you will divide it by lot as an inheritance for yourselves, and I get this, and for the strangers who dwell among you. The strangers, who is that? The foreigners, the aliens, the non-Israelites who dwell among you. They shall be to you as native-born among the children of Israel, they shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. An inheritance, you get that? Gentiles, as we call them, non-Israelites, will have an inheritance <clears throat> with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it shall be that <clears throat> it shall be that in whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance, says the Lord God. So is the inheritance, are the blessings exclusively, exclusively for Israel? No, no, this, see this passage, a passage like this, there are many other passages we could look at, shows that it was never God's intent to make the blessing, the Torah blessings, those blessings described in the Torah, in the promises given to Israel, the covenant made with Israel, never was it God's intent to restrict those to Israel. And this is one of many passages that bring that out. So, this brief passage tells us that non-Israelites and non-Jews will live among the tribes of the restored kingdom. And will not only have an inheritance in the land promised to Abraham and his seed, but will also enjoy all the blessings that God promised to Israel. Those Torah blessings, if you want to call them that. Like their Israelite neighbors, they too will be Torah observant citizens of the elect nation. Now, originally, when I sat down to prepare this message, I intended to end up in Romans the 11th chapter. I was going to summarize chapter 9 and 10 and then focus especially on chapter 11 because Paul puts the cap on this story. Those chapters are not, you know, Paul talks about election, the elect, don't listen to the Calvinists on what that's about, they're wrong. The election is not about individual election to salvation or reprobation to damnation, as the Calvinists have you believe. It is about the elect nation and God's purpose for Israel and Israel's destiny. That's what those chapters deal with. And they deal with the question of what about this present age when Israel is still in this state of unfaithfulness, 
when they have not been restored as the model nation, how can God's promise take effect now? Paul answers that question. He answers it in uh, Romans 9 through 11. And that's the subject we're going to take play, we're going to take up next week in part two of the elect nation.